Joining us now from Henry Ford Jackson Hospital, emergency services physician, Dr. Alan Lazara. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too, Bart, how are you? I'm good, good. are you all ready for Christmas? Mostly, got all the gifts ready. So you have uh, little ones. Yeah, I got three uh, kids, six, eight, and 10. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, they're, these are the, the, the really fun times with Christmas, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, what you have, uh, uh, you know, with Christmas, there are some things that are unusual for the season that I know you guys see in the uh, emergency department. What typically are you going to see come in the door? You know, we see uh, the standard fare, uh, coughs, colds, traumas, um, car accidents, things like that. But um, we know generally nobody wants to be there on Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. Um, so the, the suspicion that there's something more serious or sinister going on is, is always there. Um, but one of the things that I think we see an uptick of, especially not necessarily related to Christmas, but more so the winter time, is that we see a lot of slips and falls in our older patients. And so we see a lot of uh, hip fractures or back injuries, head injuries. And so um, what I wanted to talk about today was kind of just like what happens when somebody comes in and they've fallen and, and, and what we do, what we're suspicious about when it comes to um, somebody's hip injury, not not that that's the only thing that gets injured, but I thought that was an approachable topic. Yeah, so it's so. it's the ice and the snow, it's just- Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and everybody knows growing up, I grew up in Chicago for 30 years and we had the similar kind of weather um, when we were there and uh, you know, the black ice and walking out of your car and you don't even see it that it's there and boom, somebody falls down. And when you're older, we all know that your bones can thin out and the musculature is not as strong, the balance is not as good. Um, and I think, you know, when I grew up, what I learned was, you know, cardiovascular health is so important. You have to run to stay in shape and, and live longer. But what I've noticed as an emergency medicine physician is the patients that seem to have the hardest time as they get older are ones that lose the ability to move and get up and go, get out of a chair. Um, kind of this idea that if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, and so strength, um, and uh, mobility and, and uh, flexibility become very important as we get older. So um, if you know anybody who's older, if you're you know, concerned about your parents, like getting them into a, a yoga class, even you know, video screen at home or just strength exercises are extremely important because um, that can help prevent some of these falls that we see. Keep moving. Yeah, that's All a right. big deal. So the hip, I'm familiar with the hip because I have a... Uh, you have two of them. I have them. Yeah, I have two. I have one real and one not. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. good. So you brought a hip. Uh, yeah, so so this is the normal anatomy of the hip. This is uh, part of the pelvis looking from the backside, and the hip's divided. Uh, it's a joint just like our shoulder joint. It's a ball and socket joint, and it's held together by the, the ball and cup, and then there's a labrum, which is kind of like a cuff around that ball and cup, and the anatomy is very similar to your shoulder. And the reason we can't do the kind of uh, 360 movement with our hip is because we do a lot of sitting as we uh, age. Uh, mm -hmm. Babies have much more mobile hips than older patients uh, or, or you or I. Um, and so hip fractures can occur in multiple different places and they typically occur in this uh, transition area by the femoral neck, that kind of thin spot between the ball and the shaft of uh, the femur. And we classify them differently, not terribly important for this show, but um, depending on where the fracture is, how displaced it is, depends on what kind of treatment is needed. If it's a, a slight fracture or only a stress fracture, then they may uh, observe and wait, or they might put a, a, a nail in between the two bones to try and keep it together. Or with those fractures you saw there, that person would likely need a complete uh, total hip repair. Or total oh, wow. Hip, so total hip there, are they they're gonna come in in really severe pain? Typically, you know, so, we're always trying to differentiate between is this a hip fracture, or his hip dislocation, or is it just a hip um, strain? So we start with an x-ray. Um, people who have hip dislocations generally are not in a, a great deal of pain. People who have hip fractures are in a lot of pain pretty much when you move them. But if they're just sitting there, a lot of patients are like, I'm okay. But with any kind of slight movement in the bed, they're, they're very painful. Mm -hmm. um, so we start with an x-ray. We start with pain medication um, and, you know, 
it's kind of like salt. You can always add more. So we start with some of the, sometimes some of the non-opioid medications. Sometimes we have to start with the opioid medications right away. And then we get them to x-ray to make sure they're comfortable during that process. If the hip x-ray is diagnostic right from the outset, then, then we're good. If, mm -hmm. if the person has an x-ray that we're not really sure whether or not there's a hip fracture, um, then we'll try and walk the patient, which is very important because um, if the person's still having a ton of pain, then we progress to a CT scan or an MRI of the hip. Because we don't want to send anybody home. You know, mobility is so important, especially with our patients. We try and take a whole view of the situation. Do you live alone? Can anybody help you? Um, do you have stairs, et cetera? Um, and we're, we're very attuned uh, to that because we know that if we send you home and you can't go to the bathroom or walk or go to the store, what are you going to do? You know, so, yeah. um, so we're always aware of that. And if, it's very helpful when family's there too, you know, that, because they can advocate. That's something also too that I've learned that um, and I want for my own family is if you have a family member there that can advocate for you, um, I, I think it's wonderful. Patients get, I think, better care uh, all around because we can come together as like a group around that person. Um, and so our goal at, at IEP, you know, we always try and address the family member in the room. Who'd you bring with you? Sometimes I say, thanks for bringing your wife. And they say, it's my daughter. And that's really <laughs> awkward, um, but that's okay. I've learned my lesson enough times to not do that. But um, so anyway, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to have family there. All right. So let's prevent the falls in the first place. Sure. Then... Absolutely. So one of the things that, um, like we talked about before, we want to make sure that as we age, we continue our strength and mobility. But some small things that we can do now, you know, if you have older parents or grandparents, it's a good idea, you know, when people have new babies, they go down on the floor level, on the baby level, and they look around, or there are things the baby can put in their mouth, or there are electrical sockets that the baby can stick things in. It's the same thing with our older patients, not that they're babies, but we're just getting to their level looking what would be something that might harm them. And so lamp cords and rugs that are not secure to the floor, uh, you know, if you have steps that have no rails on them, um, your mom or dad has really old, bad footwear, um, or especially like ice outside the house, you want to make sure that that's taken care of. All those small things can really help prevent a bad mm -hmm. fall. You know, we see people walking down their driveways, you know, they got, in, in this county people tend to have longer driveways and they walk and then there's ice down there and then they slip and fall. I've seen that every year like five times. Somebody mm -hmm. slips on the way of the mailbox or the garbage cans or whatever. So, um, but yeah, those small things I think can, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Senior proof your house. For sure, <clears throat> you know, I, you know, same for me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm only 41, but I don't want lamp cords in the middle of the night to, to jungle gym over. Yeah, and you're right. Um, it's not that um, people older are more prone to fall. It's the, the hazards are greater and the, the damage is more severe because kids, they're made out of plastic. Sure, yes. Kids are very uh, malleable and, and very resilient for sure. And, you know, as we age, our bones get thinner. Our ability to recover and heal is also lower. Um, so prevention becomes much more important as we get older. All right. Uh, also, you have um, heart issues that you'll see uh, during the holidays. Yeah, we do. And I think this <clears throat> is, I would say, uh, emergency medicine uh, is build is this kind of fast paced, um, you know, they call it lifestyle medicine. I would disagree with both of those in, <laughs> in a lot of different ways, but we see a lot of chest, belly, and back pain um, all day long. That's like our forte. Um, and so chest pain, we all take very seriously because I think everybody's known or has uh, somebody that is close to them that's had a heart issue or a heart attack and see a lot of people in their 40s, 50s, 60s coming in and they're concern that they're having a heart attack or having uh, heart trouble. And uh, I, I very much understand that. And so we have a very standardized way that we go about working up chest pain. Um, so I brought some images of probably the first thing that somebody gets when they come into the ER is uh, an EKG, which is an electrical uh, tracing of the heart's activity. And it looks like uh, squiggles. Sometimes we call them danger squiggles, but they're um, we can tell a lot based off of just this one piece of paper. I so, can tell this person's lying. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does look like a lie detector test in some some ways. But uh, the EKG or ECG uh, shows us the way the electricity passes through the heart, and each segment there corresponds to an anatomical location on the heart. So, 
two, three AVF, those correspond to the right coronary artery um, and generally the back side of the heart. And the other ones, I'll spare you the details, but each section we look at kind of ge geogra geographically and tell, can tell if there's uh, lack of oxygen uh, getting to that part of the heart or if the heart's moving too fast or too slowly. Um, and so there's another slide too. Now you can tell people, you can tell if someone had a heart attack like a half hour ago? Yeah, generally, so somebody will have uh, changes on their EKG in the ST interval, ST segment, uh, where the heart's repolarizing, so the electrical signal goes through, and then it resets, uh, kind of like you know, pushing a button, it resets on its own, and we'll see that electrical activity change, and so depending on that yellow spot, it will move up or down if somebody's having signs up if they've had death of heart cells, down if they're having lack of oxygen, Sometimes the, some of the, the bumps on the, the tracing will flip upside down and we'll see those as early ischemic changes or lack of blood flow. Um, so that is the most important test right from the outset. That and the history, you know, somebody says I've been having exertional chest pain going up the stairs for the last day and then now it's just not getting better. I'm sweaty, nauseous, I have pain in my face, my arm. Um, so we take those we take those complaints very seriously. Anybody who has chest pain gets an EKG pretty much as soon as they show up, so. And do people typically have pain where, with the broken hip, they can't stand it? Mm. Uh, do they have the same kind of pain where you have to? Um... It's, it's a different kind of pain. You know, our organs feel pain much differently than our, our musculature and our bones or our skin. It's hard to locate. Sometimes people come in and they have like indigestion or nausea. Um, we see in particular these atypical presentations in our older patients. Typically women, they, they don't have the standard pain of like my chest is hurting and they're grabbing their chest and you know, it's going through the back. It's I've been fatigued and I'm nauseous and I'm short of breath. Those are the most common complaints we see in our older female patients. Can, so, can you give yourself a heart attack from eating or drinking too much? Um, Depends on what you're eating and drinking. If it's like cocaine, yeah. yeah. But uh, if you're doing just standard eating and drinking, generally not. But like in a lifetime, yes. If you eat and drink too much and you're overweight, you're gonna have coronary artery disease and high blood pressure and, and high cholesterol. Um, but not just like, you know, um, gorging yourself on, on you know, Christmas turkey, so. What's holiday heart? Holiday heart's another thing too. So part of the EKG, we look at the rate and rhythm. Holiday heart is um, also known as atrial fibrillation. It's when somebody comes in, they've generally consumed too much alcohol or um, sometimes the electrical system just degrades uh, over time as we age. Uh, there's a, a laundry list of causes of atrial fibrillation as long as my arm. Sometimes uh, hyperthyroidism will cause it. But what it is, it's an ir irregularly irregular rhythm, meaning you had a marching band drummer from MSU or U of M marching your heart out, whatever your preference. But then, I, or Ohio State, I guess, I don't know, whatever your... Not too many Ohio State fans watching. <laughs> okay, good. So anyway, um, you went from a marching band drummer to a, a jazz drummer. And so the heart beats very irregularly. And people find this very disconcerting. You know, they're, they're feeling like they're having palpitations, their heart's racing. Um, I feel like it's all over the place, like it's flip, people describe flip-flopping inside their chest. And so, um, you know, we see that a lot too around the holidays. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Again, so, they're lying. Yes, yeah. Excuse but me. so normally we see very regular intervals in the, uh, in the EKG, but this we see uh, that it's kind of irregular. The spaces in between the peaks are not the same. and so. This is typically treated with IV or oral medications, sometimes blood thinners, depending on somebody's other medical problems and how old they are. Um, but it's easily treatable. And we used to, when I was a resident, we would admit all these patients to the hospital. And through you know, our leadership and our department, we've come up with protocols to be able to get people home on the right medications, observe them in the department for a couple hours, get them on the right medicines, and then you know, do a, a walking trial and say, hey, follow up with a cardiologist in a couple days, here's a number. We have a clinic that's set up to absorb these patients, and it's much better for everybody. We want to try and keep patients out of the hospital as much as possible, you know, um, right. because nobody likes to nobody likes to be there, you know. So especially at Christmas. Especially at Christmas, absolutely. You're absolutely right. So a lot of people uh, will be traveling and uh, 
anybody that's been out on the roads this week, uh, I think can agree with me. It's crazy out there. Yeah, and I've noticed that too. Yeah, there's there are crashes. Yeah. Right? And then they, they're coming in. Yeah, so we see a lot of car accidents, and I think, um, you know, I think people are worried about, from, from my perspective, a lot of people are worried about, uh, I'm gonna have a heart attack, or I'm gonna have a stroke, or I'm gonna have this, or the, the, I'm gonna get cancer, all these things that people are, you know, paranoid about to a degree, myself included. But the thing that you're most likely gonna have happen to you if you're in the ages between like 17 and 50 is you're gonna get into a car accident. You know, that's the, the highest mortality rate is with motor vehicle collisions. Um, for a while it was opioids, which is shocking, but now it's, it's back to motor vehicle crashes, I believe. Um, so, you know, people do a lot of driving, so you got to take precautions. Don't drive aggressively, please. You know, use the right lane, not the left lane if you're going slow, right? And wear your seatbelt, right? So, um, but we see the ramifications. I think if people could see how... Um, how injured somebody is after a car accident. People would drive maybe a little slower, be a little more cautious, because it's, it's pretty awful, you know, especially when somebody doesn't wear their seatbelt. The, the number of injuries they have are just so profound, and then their lives generally are not the same afterwards. So oh, nice. it's really, really sad. You know? All right, well, let's stay out of the emergency department this holiday season and uh, all, all the time. I hope you have a light load during the holidays. Yeah, me too. Thanks for coming in. Thanks a lot, Bart. Appreciate it. That Merry Christmas. You too, sir. From Henry Ford Jackson Hospital Emergency Services Physician, Dr. Alan Lazara. Stay tuned. Lots more to come.